They look like the perfect couple. But behind the scenes, it was very volatile. Firearms, affairs. Rama shot and killed. Well, we know that. And then the question is, who's behind it? Black Widow. Margaret Rudin is a chameleon. She's been a blonde, a brunette, and a redhead. I like change. I'm a Gemini. Did you want to hear he was the best lover I ever had? Margaret Rudin dubbed the Black Widow of Las Vegas. Black Widow. Black Widow. Black Widow. Black Widow. Black Widow. Like I had killed somebody before. She was charged and convicted of murder. She's been locked up for the brutal beheading and murder of her millionaire husband, Ron Rudin. The Black Widow killer of Las Vegas has officially had her conviction vacated. The case against her, purely circumstantial. They had no evidence. They had no witnesses. There's so many holes in this case. After going through all this stuff, considering everything, I'm convinced that Margaret Rudin's innocent. Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to try to stay as far away from the camera as possible because, warning, I'm going to show you something gross with my eye. If you don't like that, double tap. But I uh, popped a vessel in my eye, OK? Whatever, I was carrying something way too heavy and um, I popped a vessel in my eye. What if I just did the video like this? Hi guys! Um, so today, <laughs> okay, shut up, shut up. Today I wanna talk about Margaret Rudin, AKA the Black Widow of Las Vegas. See, although Margaret was found guilty of her husband's murder, her sentence has recently been vacated and she's always maintained her innocence, refused plea deals that would have significantly reduced her time. Her trial was an absolute mess, a shit show. One of the jurors even felt pressured to find her guilty and says it was the biggest regret of her life. So there are people who believe that Margaret absolutely did this, but that she didn't do it alone, although no one has been charged. That's a whole other thing we'll get into. And there are people who think she's innocent. So I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I want to give you guys the facts. We'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. I hate myself just completely today, especially. This video is sponsored by Fuzzy. Fuzzy is a telehealth service that provides pet parents with 24 seven access to personalized pet care by veterinary professionals. If you're anything like me and your pet is doing something weird or you're freaking out and it's the middle of the night, you start Googling and Googling and spiraling and Googling. She said, mommy, have you cleaned my chamber pot? It's filthy. She's like, I hate you. Please stop. I'm sorry. The cool thing about Fuzzy is they're veterinary professionals. You get 24 seven access to them. You can ask them any question you want. Right now, Fuzzy is offering my subscribers a free seven day trial membership. Go to yourfuzzy.com slash Noor today to sign up. That's a free seven day trial and access to exclusive member discounts on pet meds, supplements, food, and more at Y-O-U-R-F-U-Z-Z-Y.com slash Noor. Again, yourfuzzy.com slash Noor for your free trial of Fuzzy with access to 24 seven personalized pet care and vet recommended products. So the whole thing started on December 20th, 1994, when Ron Rudin did not show up to work. Now, Ron was a multi-millionaire land developer, real estate mogul in Las Vegas, and he was known for his work ethic. He always showed up to work every day on time, and if he was ever late or running late or whatever, he always called the office and let his employees know. So when he didn't show up to work and he didn't call, his employees began to worry. Now there are two versions of events about what happened next. According to Margaret, she said that she came home really late at 2 a.m. She was working at her store and doing all these things. And when she came home, she noticed that her husband Ron's car wasn't there and that the burglar alarm was disabled, but she didn't think anything of it because he was really stressed out about this property that he was selling. And she just figured that he left to go check on it and disabled the alarm so that when he came home, it wouldn't wake her up. Plus she was super tired, so she just went to sleep. She says that the next day when he wasn't there and she couldn't reach him, she became concerned. She called the office. 
he wasn't there and so then she called the police but police told her you have to wait 48 hours before we can file a missing persons report the police give a different account they say that margaret never contacted them that it was ron's employees that contacted them and that they then contacted margaret the police and they told her listen like the co-workers are wanting to file a missing persons report like do you want us to accept it from them or should we file it from you? And that she promptly came to the station and filed a missing persons report. So it depends who you believe on that one. But in any case, it was two days after Ron was last seen that he was reported missing. Soon after, the police go to Margaret's antique store that she owns. They question her and then they ask her, hey, uh, can we go to your home and look at your home, search your home? She says, okay. They go to her home, they don't see anything suspicious, and then they leave. Then, on December 23rd, 1994, Ron's Cadillac was found. It was parked in an alley behind a gentleman's club called the Crazy Horse 2 Saloon in Vegas. Now the thing is, Ron always kept his car clean, but it was dusty and muddy. So that was weird. And then the car was locked. Once cops gained entry into the car, they noticed that there were four sets of muddy footprints inside the car. So it seemed like there were four people in that car. And they fingerprint tested the car and they found prints on the car, but those prints did not match Margaret's prints or Ron's prints. So whose fingerprints were they? That's something we still don't know and we'll never know, maybe, I don't know. This is when rumors began swirling, because think about it, right? It's the early 90s and Ron was a multimillionaire real estate mogul, land developer in Vegas, and he had been there since the 60s. And so the period of time where he was doing all this was when the Vegas mafia was in control. Vegas was cruel. The mob was real. They did run things. They would blow up your car. They would do whatever they had to do to make their point across. People were saying that this looked like some kind of mob thing because they said he had shady connections with the mob. Some people will say that Ron Rudin was unscrupulous, that it was anything at all costs to make money. There was talks that he had connection with South American cartels because Ron had a $3 million gun collection. He was a licensed gun collector. He had this crazy huge armory and they said that he would sell his guns to the cartels, like people who couldn't legally acquire guns, he would sell them to them. Ron was a licensed gun collector. There was talk he had connections to South America. Running guns to Colombian drug lords in South America. Part of that was because he had access to so many weapons. He had hundreds of weapons at his disposal at his house. And they said that he had this property, Lee Canyon, that he was really stressed out about selling and that there was some shady things going on with that too. And so people were starting to say that maybe something had happened with the deal and something with money and basically the mob or the cartels did something to run. Weeks went by and still no leads. So on January 13th, 1995, trustees of Ron's estate offered a reward of $25,000 for any information leading to Ron's whereabouts. Then about two weeks later, there was a major break in the case. Fishermen discovered the remains near Lake Mojave. At first, they noticed a skull. Then they found the charred remains of bones that were like in a, a metal frame of a trunk near the skull. And then when police came, they found that the skull had four bullet holes that were in the back of the skull. And they had to use dental records to identify the remains and they found that they belonged to Ron. But see, that's not all. They noticed that there was a gold bracelet and the bracelet had Ron's name on it. That's when rumors of a mob hit really intensified because they're like, oh, they left the Cadillac, you know, they left the skull, they made sure to leave the chain. It's like, they want people to know. One of Ron and Margaret's friends said, quote, the skull, the bracelet, the Cadillac, it's all left there intentionally. But then 
then Margaret became the suspect because after that reward was announced, someone came forward, a handyman by the name of Augustine Lovato. I'm going to call him Lovato. So Lovato, he comes out and he says, I was hired by Margaret when Ron was still missing and the things I saw gave me the heebie-jeebies. But then we would later find out that it wasn't Lovato who came to police first. It was actually his mom. He didn't want to go to police. Okay, so his mom ended up finding a box in his car that when she opened it had connections to this case and Lovato tells her what he knows and she goes to police because she thinks he's going to get in trouble for this crime and she's trying to protect her son who is a convicted felon so she thinks if they determine foul play they're going to blame it on my son. Lovato's mom her name is Terry Hall and I found these quotes from her in an old newspaper clipping. He told me she was changing the master bedroom into an office and that made me uncomfortable, Hall said. He said, Mom, it looked like someone had taken those ketchup packets and squirted it at the picture. While Lovato was unwilling to go to authorities, Hall said she called police after finding a shoebox size package that Lovato said Margaret had given him, but he left under the car seat and forgot to mail. He didn't want me to call police, she said. He said he thought Margaret Rudin was a sweet woman who couldn't think anything like that, much less kill anyone. Police speak to Lovano and what he had to say was disturbing. Now remember, police went to Margaret's home before Lovato went there and they didn't see anything, right? They didn't see anything suspicious, but he said when he went there, he saw blood stains on the carpet and spatter. He said Margaret asked him to remove the parts of the carpet that were soiled and that it looked like someone had tried to clean the stains, but that the stains wouldn't go away. So I guess she wanted him to just remove it completely. Okay, so remember that box that Margaret gave to Lovato? She told him to mail it to her mother. And he says he forgot to mail it and it was in the car and his mom found it. So police were like, uh, give us the box and they end up getting a search warrant for the box and they were convinced that the murder weapon was going to be in the box but it wasn't instead what was in the box was something that opened up a whole nother can of worms in the box they find uh love letters and a photo of a man now this man is not Ron Rudin the man was Yehuda Sharon now Yehuda was an ex-Israeli Mossad agent Okay, which is kind of like the CIA of Israel. But now he was selling holy oils and holy water to churches. There was a postcard in there from Israel and it was to Margaret and it was signed Love Yehuda. And then there was a photo of Yehuda and uh, a handwritten letter from Margaret to her mother saying, please hold on to my yay or yeah or something like that. Y-E. Is Margaret having an affair with Yehuda? We weren't having an affair because I was married. If I hadn't have been married, he wasn't my type. And is Yehuda somehow involved in this crime? Did they conspire to kill Ron? What's going on? The mystery man police really wanted to talk to. Yehuda Sharon, an Israeli national with dual citizenship in the U.S., and Margaret. Police surveilled Margaret and Yehuda, snapping photos of the pair together. The deception was deepening. So police find Yehuda and they speak to him and he denies a romantic relationship or anything to do with the crime. He's like, we are just friends. I helped her with some computer stuff. I have nothing to do with it. But police weren't really buying it. So they do some digging and they find out that Yehuda rented a van at around the same time that Ron went missing. And he tells them, yeah, I rented the van and I drove it to California. But Yehuda had an alibi that night. His girlfriend at the time claimed she was with him and her story checked out. Then they check the mileage and they say that the mileage doesn't add up. And he goes, yeah, well, I was going to drive to California. But then I found out from the truckers on the CV that it was raining. And so I changed my mind. And that's why the mileage doesn't add up. So they're like, okay, 
They still don't believe him, but it's still not enough to arrest him or anything like that. And he's not really saying much more. So the DA decides to give Yehuda immunity, thinking that he's going to speak to them because they think he did something and that he'll flip on Margaret. But even with immunity, his story doesn't change. And there still is no evidence linking them because remember the Cadillac, there's fingerprints on the Cadillac. They don't match anyone that they've found yet. There's four sets of footprints in the car. Right now they only have two suspects. Is Lovato in on a two? That's still only three. Mm, it's all circumstantial. It doesn't look good for Margaret or Yehuda, but still the police can't arrest them or do anything. They even try to take this information to a grand jury to get an indictment and they can't. But the cops still had their theory, okay? They are like, there's motive because Ron was a multimillionaire and he had, I think, 10 million and Margaret was set to inherit six out of that 10 million. So there's motive there. Then she's having an affair. So there's another motive there. And then means and opportunity. Well, you know, she lived with him. And then she has this ex Mossad agent lover that could seem to find a way to do it. Plus there's the whole van. So in their mind, it's like open and shut case. Like they did it, but they still can't pin it on them. All they had to go off of was what the handyman Lovato said. But the thing with Lovato is not many people found him credible. First, he was a convicted felon and it was a violent offense. Then there was the fact that he didn't speak up until the reward was uh, offered. And even then it was his mom who came forward. So that was also not enough to get an indictment, but cops were hell bent on Margaret being the killer, especially because they said that her reaction when they told her that they found Ron's remains, that was the nail in the coffin for them. This is what they said, quote, she looked at me and said, Oh my goodness. She started rubbing her eye, but the eye remained dry. And Rudin showed little emotion and asked no questions about how her husband's body was found. Cops came to tell me about Ron. Your mind can't take so much at one time. I was in shock. So although they couldn't charge her, they were able to get a search warrant for the home. They go back to the home and they look again. And this time they notice blood spatter on the walls and the ceilings of the master bedroom. But get this. They couldn't say that it was Ron's blood because someone else was shot in that very master bedroom and it wasn't renovated or redecorated. And that person was Ron's ex-wife, Peggy. The gun that she used to kill herself with had Ron's fingerprints on it. It raised eyebrows. People thought maybe he killed Peggy. She did not know that the house had not been renovated since Peggy's suicide. One night, he said to me, quietly, what would you say if I told you I murdered Peggy? And I kind of caught my breath, and I didn't know what to say, because if I'd have said, yes, I want the details, I would have had to have left. I just said, no, no, you're not going to relieve your guilt by telling me I don't want to know. He said, okay. And we never brought it up again. Also, side note, how creepy and gross is it that the room was not redecorated or renovated or anything to where the fact that there could still be blood from that uh, was very possible. And don't forget, this is like the early days of DNA, so they couldn't really determine from that little amount of spatter that was there. So although they found that, again, it's like, it looks bad, but we can't prove it 100%. This is a good time to mention that both Margaret and Ron had been married several times before. I think it was Margaret's fourth marriage and Ron's fifth marriage. I think I fall in love too easily. <laughs> so at this point, police are not considering any other suspects. They're not looking at the mob anymore, the cartels, none of that. They're zeroed in on Margaret and then another major break in the case. On July 21st, 1996, a scuba diver discovered a 22 caliber Ruger handgun with a silencer attached while diving near Pyramid Island at Lake Mead. 
The gun was wrapped in several plastic bags and they were secured with rubber bands. So everything was well preserved. Then when they like ran uh, the registration, they found that it was registered to Ron Rudin in 1980. And they obtained records from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And they found out that Ron had reported the gun missing in October, 1988. And in the letter he sent to the Bureau, he said that he thought his wife, Margaret was the one who took it because she had left the home one day and they were about to get a divorce. Like they separated and got back together a lot. They never officially divorced. And in one of those times where she packed her stuff and left, he thinks she took that gun. And now he's dead and this gun is like in the bottom of a lake. So police end up doing a ballistics test and they match the bullets from that gun to the bullets that were found in his head because they found two that were lodged in his skull that they found. So now police are like, okay, she did this. The problem with that is they can't connect the murder weapon to Margaret. They can't ever put the gun in Margaret's hand. Now they take this information to a grand jury again and this time they get an indictment. They get the indictment, they contact Margaret's lawyer and wouldn't you know, Margaret is gone. According to her attorney, she left three weeks before the indictment. She had no idea. She went to visit her mother. But uh, once the news came out that she was indicted, she never came back. And she basically went on the run for two years. She was on America's Most Wanted. Margaret Rudin is a chameleon. She's been a blonde, a brunette, and a redhead. Even when I sit in front of your cameras, I may look different. <laughs> But you're still gonna know it's me. <laughs> She's a chameleon, that definitely. <laughs> I like to wear wigs. <laughs> I like short, I like long, I like curly, I like straight. I like change. I'm a Gemini. Later on, Margaret would explain why she went on the run. She said, quote, at that time, I think I was so ready for a nervous breakdown. I didn't think that far ahead. I just wanted to get out of Vegas. I wanted peace of mind. She said she couldn't get a job and was running out of money because everyone knew her as the Black Widow of Las Vegas. Two years later, in 1999, Margaret is found. She was in a small town near Boston, Massachusetts, and she was living in, quote, squalor. Margaret, the soft-spoken grandmother, was in a jail jumpsuit back in Las Vegas. The stage was set for a circus-like trial, one that Las Vegas had never seen before. Prosecutors would point the finger squarely at Margaret, painting her as jealous, crafty, and above all, greedy. This is when the case became sensational. Not all the stuff I told you before, this is when, because the trial was a shit show, literally. I mean, there was an actual defecation there, but I'm just saying, maybe figuratively is the word, figuratively. There was problems. He was a, a difficult person at times. But yes, I did, I did love him. That was Margaret in February 2001, just days before the opening statements in a case that was about to be broadcast live on national TV. Why would someone want to kill Ron? I wish I could answer that. I wish I could. It wasn't just the juicy details because man, were there some juicy details in the trial. It was the actual defense attorney, Margaret's defense attorney. People said he was coked out most of the time. Okay. He was so bad, objectively bad. The opening statements made by defense attorney Michael Amador in March 2001 left the courtroom and judge Joe Bonaventure stunned. When Michael Amador stood in front of the jury, and was completely unprepared. A rambling, nonsensical speech. Her lawyer's opening statements were literally over two hours. I think it was two hours and 25 minutes of the most rambling, ridiculous opening statements. He starts off like pouring his water, addressing everyone like her and the lawyer and the prosecutor and the judge. And then he's like, today is a great day. <laughs> like what? Margaret. He's like, I had an opening statement prepared and I threw it away. And let me tell you about this and my family and blah, blah. I mean, it looked like he was not prepared and he just, like, you know, when you start talking and you don't know when to stop. And so you just keep going and going. Yeah. But he did that for two and a half hours in a murder trial. Oh, well, again, uh, 
I, I keep saying this, to, and, and I let you get away with a lot, Mr. Amador, but the purpose of a opening statement is just to indicate what the evidence is going to tend to show and not go into your personal beliefs and your passion and your soccer uh, dad and your yelling at the uh, staff and you, 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 when you were a green lawyer and you know all the cops and you used to be a DA and you communicate differently. I never heard that in an opening statement in my life. I'm about, I was at the end of, I guess, that page in that portion. Okay. I need some help in this case. <clears throat> the photographs stink. I'm sorry. They're so bad. When you go through the case, when you look at at the state's theory and what it must prove, you'll find that Margaret Rudin was a suspect at a time when there didn't seem to be a lot of, if any, evidence against her. But they'll try to prove <laughs> not only was the opening statement absurd but the cross examinations were useless useless the whole thing was bad it gets to a point where uh several times it seems like margaret wanted a mistrial but it never happened and instead of granting her a mistrial the judge tells that lawyer his name is michael amador he tells michael amador to to back off like to take a back seat and then there's two other attorneys that are now the ones that are doing everything it got so bad the judge at one point forbids michael amador from talking to him and then michael amador starts whispering to one of the other attorneys what to say to the judge so now let's talk about what was revealed the evidence the witnesses all of that ron and margaret married in 1987 and from the beginning their marriage was tumultuous there were rumors of cheating ron cheating and also margaret said he was a heavy drinker margaret also said that ron was paranoid and the thing is that was kind of true ron was very obsessed with security well he got paranoid the older he got and the worse he was drinking and he really started getting paranoid people described his home as a fortress so here's how the living setup was he owned a strip mall and he also owned some of the businesses in the strip mall that was where his main office was he also his home was right behind the strip mall and he had really long not long tall uh gates or walls he had security system he had his armory he had a three million dollar armory he had guard dogs i mean he was super super into security and this was connected to the people he dealt with the shady deals he had his connections with the cartel with the mob he never went anywhere without his gun remember that land deal i told you about it was called lee canyon he was going to sell this property i think they were going to do like a trailer park on the property people said that ron at one point had addressed a shady organization to ask for money for funding to develop this property. And this is where people think there might have been an issue here. Did something go wrong with the money? Did they want something back and he couldn't afford it? And then this whole thing happened. Margaret would pop up at his office a lot. And it was, you know, the old days where if you picked up the phone, you could hear if what someone was saying. So she did that and she heard that he was talking to another woman. And so she got upset and then at one point in 1991, there was apparently an altercation between Margaret and one of the employees, one of Ron's employees, and Ron banned Margaret from his office. And so in response to that, she ends up bugging the office. Like she got a recording device that had a receiver where she could be in her home, which is right behind the strip mall, and she could listen to what was going on in the office. Through this bugging device, Margaret discovers that Ron is having an affair with his ex-wife. No, that's not true, his ex-girlfriend. When she discovers the affair and confronts Ron about it, there's apparently this explosive fight that happens and a gun goes off and someone gets slapped, but this is Margaret's version of events. He didn't care that I heard the conversation. He slapped me. And so I got the gun, he wrestled it out of my hand, and I said, okay, that's it, I'm out of here. And he said, no, 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 you don't have to go. I promise you nothing like that will ever happen again. After this incident occurs, 
Ron appoints a secret directive to his trustees. And it says, quote, in the event my death is caused by violent means, for example, gunshot, knife, or a violent automobile accident, extraordinary steps be taken in investigating the true cause of the death. Should said death be caused directly or indirectly by a beneficiary of my estate, said beneficiary shall be totally excluded from my estate and or any trusts I may have in existence. Many people think he's talking about Margaret, but there's something with that too, because um, he doesn't name her specifically. And there are other trustees that later on are accused of killing him. And the reason why people say it's not Margaret is because shortly after he does that, he actually increases Margaret's share of the inheritance. So at first she was going to get 40% of his estate. He increases it to 60%. So some people are like, if he thought she was going to kill him and he didn't want her to get the money, why wouldn't he name her and why would he increase her share? And then other people are like, well, he didn't want to piss her off and let her know in case it wasn't her. And maybe they were trying to work things out and that's why he increased it. So I don't know. You interpret it how you will. But the same year that he increased her percentage, he also was having an affair. So I don't know, was that guilt? I don't know. So in, it's 1993 and Ron is cheating again. And people say that Margaret knows. And this is when Margaret becomes close with who? Yehuda Sharon. Remember the Israeli ex-Mossad agent who's selling holy oils now? Yes. So it is around this time we're leading up to Ron's disappearance and murder, okay, 1994, it's about to pop off. This same year, Ron spends $100,000 to open an antique shop for Margaret in the same strip mall that he owns, that's his office, that's near the home. In that same thing, she now has an antique store. People say she knows nothing about antiques, but it's something that she wanted and he paid for it. Then just weeks before Christmas. Now remember, Ron goes missing on December 20th. Okay, so about a week to two weeks before he goes missing, he calls his friends concerned. He says he found that Margaret had written some papers that she was like adding up all of Ron's assets and that worried him. And he told his friend about it. And his friend is like, you better watch your back. And he says, I'm really getting nervous. I told him, you better watch your back. And then a few weeks later, he goes missing and then you know the rest. So this is all revealed in trial. Here's where the handyman comes into play. Remember Lovato, the handyman whose mom called all of that. Okay. So he testifies and his credibility gets attacked. And then the defense attorney, now this wasn't Amador. Remember, he's been relegated to whisper to the other ones and he can't speak. It's the other one. His name is Pitaro. This, I mean, none of the defense attorneys were that great, but, but no one was as bad as Amador. This is Pitaro. So he comes out and he tells the handyman Lovato, oh, it gave you the heebie-jeebies, but you didn't call police even after you knew he was missing. You only went to authorities after an award, there was an offer for a reward, sorry, that was announced. And your mom is the one who came out. Oh, and aren't you a convicted felon for a violent crime? He like hit someone with a baseball bat. Oh, and you said he gave you the heebie-jeebies and you were all weirded out, but you went back to Margaret. You sought her out in 1995 and asked her for more work. Hmm. Are you telling the truth? Oh, and you said you saw all this blood, but the investigators were there before you and they didn't see anything. How come you saw it and they didn't see it? And then the defense were bringing up the fact that there was no physical evidence linking anything to Margaret. The, f the fingerprints on the Cadillac, the footprints on the Cadillac, the gun. Okay, it was suspected that she took it, but they're like, what, she took it six years and waited six years to do it? The prosecution was like, no, she took it because maybe she was already planning to do this for a long time and she decided to strike in that moment when she found out he was still having an affair. And then it was like, okay, so how did she do it? Because his body, he was big and tall and she was small and frail. So if she did shoot him, so, so this, is, this is how his body was found. He was decapitated and then his body was burnt. And the 
prosecution said that he was shot in the bedroom and then he was transported you know somehow they couldn't name Yehuda because he was given immunity so they would say that he was transported they kind of made it seem like Margaret did it transported and burnt in the desert decapitated you know who did it so was it Yehuda so now they bring Yehuda to testify and <laughs> He, even though he had immunity, he did not throw Margaret under the bus or admit to anything. Yehuda said, quote, I know that I received immunity. From what? I have no idea. So that was a bust for prosecution. Then there was an expert that said the amount of gasoline that it would take to burn the body, it would have been something like 50 gallons. And you know, how would she have done this? And then the trunk became an issue because remember there was a metal frame that remained when everything was burned. And the prosecution said that this was a trunk that Margaret had from her antique store. So they bring in this person to testify to say that he sold the this type of trunk to Margaret. But then there's a whole controversy with that too because he had no record of the sale. And then there was another person who he claimed sold him the trunk that he sold to Margaret who came out and said, I did not sell you that trunk. I sold you something way smaller and there's no way a body could have been fit into that. So it's like, what the hell is going on? So they have one witness left okay and you know who that was margaret's little sister donna how many years separate the two of you um about eight to eight and a half tell me who got into your high security house surrounded by dogs shot and killed ron in the bedroom removed him cleaned up the room so that you didn't notice anything amiss drove him 40 miles to the desert decapitated and burned him and brought his car back to town and I said, Margaret, does that sound like the mob to you? And the thing is, they were feuding, okay? She even had to admit that, quote, we have a long history of not speaking. Actually, uh, there was some sort of issue that wasn't allowed to be presented to the jury where Donna had been evicted from the home that Margaret and Rudin and Ron Rudin shared and that she had physically attacked Margaret. The next thing she said was that she couldn't remember the exact date, but she says on or around the time that Ron went missing, she went to her sister's home and she found Margaret looking over documents about Ron's will and trusts. Donna added that Margaret had found documents about Ron's ex-wife Peggy and her suicide and how one of Peggy's family members had actually made a death threat against Ron because they felt like Ron was responsible for Peggy's death. She also said that she found a certificate that Margaret got for completing a firearm safety course and a handwritten note saying it's you or him get him first basically her sister went in on her the defense's tactic was basically to try to offer other suspects they were like the trustees maybe he was talking about the trustees when he said uh, if anyone who benefits from me and i die in a violent death maybe they had something to do with it the mob the cartels blah 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 there was this crazy thing that happened where the defense team uh, tried to reenact things went from bad to worse when the defense attempted to reenact the bedroom shooting right now I'm gonna shoot you one of the attorneys is lying down in bed and the other one goes bang 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 Mr. Mama and Mr. Pataro just did some kind of reenactment in front of the jury it was unprofessional it's unethical I've never seen anything like that so fast forward to the jury deliberations because there's a whole drama with that too because there was one holdout Okay, it was a woman and she believed Margaret was innocent. And she says she was pressured, coerced into saying voting guilty. You know, when the, the foreman announces the verdict. And when I read that verdict, I looked right in her eyes and I paused symbolically. And when I said the word guilty, she didn't even blink. Guilty. Margaret Rudin, unfazed, stoic, cold. And then the judge goes and asks each juror you know, is this your verdict or so say you or whatever. And when they asked that particular juror, there was this long 
pause everyone thought she was gonna say no and then she softly said yes and then she was crying and she looked at margaret and she mouthed i'm sorry and she would say it was the biggest regret of her life and that she still hasn't forgiven herself and when margaret uh, Margaret's case was vacated, she was there to greet her. One of the things that jurors did not know is that Margaret had been offered several plea deals that significantly reduced her sentence because she ended up, when they found her guilty, they gave her 20 years with the possibility of parole after 20 years. And so they had offered her like way less time, like just a few years and she kept denying it. She kept denying it. She would say, quote, oh no, judge, I'm innocent. I'm not taking any deal. I can't plead to something I didn't do. And when asked about it later, she said, I never considered it. I'm not going to admit it. I don't care if I'm 110 and I'm still waiting. I'm not going to admit to something I didn't do. It was five plea deals that she rejected and she said there is not one thing not one thing that ties me to ron's murder forensically she goes dna analysis was different than it is today bring it out you still got to have the proof somewhere bring it out let's have it under dna standards today i did not kill ron i want the truth to come out i have waited a long time i don't know if she's just like ballsy or if she's innocent i don't know but anyway so she tries a bunch of appeals and she has the worst luck with lawyers because first she had that horrible lawyer, then she had different lawyers for appeals, but one of those lawyers just like missed the deadline and it was like a technicality and then she wasn't able to get an appeal. And so there's this other lawyer who read about it and got so upset because he's like, this is horrible. Like she did not have adequate representation and that's when uh, he took over her case and that's when her case was vacated but it was way too late because she had already paroled she served all her 20 years got paroled margaret just was released from prison this morning after serving 20 years welcome to las vegas review journal thank you what were the real hard parts for you do you think the hardest part for me was aging in prison i fell out of the top bunk they didn't put me in a top bunk until i was 71 years old three times i fell out and had a concussion and brain injury. I'm going to write books of the whole experience. If you didn't do it, who did it or what would you like to tell people about that? What I'm going to do as soon as I get money from selling one of my books, uh, I'm going to offer, just like the trustees did, I'm going to offer rewards for who will come forward. And I do blame more than anyone uh, the Las Vegas Police Department. There was a lot of test a line. I want to be exonerated. I want to be free to travel if I choose to on a passport. And it was only then that her case was vacated. So the only thing that happened was that she wasn't, uh, she, she didn't have to be under parole anymore. Like she was totally free now. And that's basically where the case stands now. She still proclaims her innocence. And those are the facts. So now let's discuss the theories. So I would say there are probably like four theories. The first one is the official theory, Margaret did it. The second one is Margaret did it, but with several accomplices. The third theory is the mob or the cartel, some kind of organized crime. And the fourth one is the other trustees. So let's start with the official theory. So. There is a lot of evidence that suggests Margaret did it, okay? The fact that the gun that was missing that her husband said she took in the 80s turned out to be the murder weapon, mm, okay? If the handyman story is true, that looks really bad, okay? Plus there was the whole thing where he was having an affair and she confronted him and some gun went off and then he changes the beneficiary to be like, if I'm violently killed, like investigate. And then he ends up violently killed. Ugh. And by the way, she only got like 600,000. She settled. There was like a civil thing with the trustees where she got 600,000, but after attorney's fees, she got less than $200,000. So she didn't really get any money uh, at all from his death. Um, and then the whole thing with Yehuda, right? Because the thing is, if she did it, there's no way she could have done it on her own. How could she have moved the body if, if she shot him in bed, as the prosecution says, and that's why the blood was there and all those stains, then 
How did she carry that body out? Where did she take it? Then you have Yehuda, right? Now Yehuda seems like the accomplice here. He rented the van, the dates lined up. It makes sense you would need a large vehicle for that to put it in a trunk, okay? Then he lied at first about like California, then the mileage didn't add up, then he changed his story. He got immunity. If they truly were lovers and he had immunity, then why would he throw her under the bus if he truly loved her? He's not going to get in trouble either way. Might as well save her. You know, so then the other thing, though, is those footprints and those fingerprints in the Cadillac. If they took the Cadillac to the desert and that's why it was muddy and dirty. Who was also involved? Because it was four sets of footprints. Let's assume two of those are Margaret and Yehuda. Who are the other two? Some other ex Mossad agents that owe Yehuda a favor? So, was it the handyman involved? You know, who was it? That's still a mystery. We still don't know who those fingerprints belong to and who those footprints belong to. Those footprints and the fingerprints bring the cartel and the organized crime into it. Because, and this is, here's the thing, right? What if it's a combination? What if it is Margaret, Yehuda, and some shady organized crime people that were hired or affiliated with Yehuda who they paid and they could make people go away. Maybe Yehuda had people. Maybe it was him and three other guys who did it. And they just never knew who to compare those fingerprints to because Yehuda had immunity, never spoke, so they couldn't figure out who it was. But all the circumstantial evidence pointed to Margaret and so they felt like you know what let's try to pin it on her especially when they found the murder weapon and there was writing saying that he suspected she took the gun that's the smoking gun if you will so then the whole thing about the beneficiaries right because a lot of people talk about the fact that he felt like she was gonna kill him he changed his will and had a whole directive being like if I die violently Nobody, whoever's responsible shouldn't get any money. So who's standing to benefit financially from him, who he's talking about here? It's either Margaret or the other trustees. So if it's not Margaret and it's the other trustees, let's think about this, right? How would they have done it? Did they have access to the murder weapon? Did they conspire with Margaret? Did they do it on their own? It all goes back to the murder weapon. Who had that gun? Was Ron correct when he suspected that Margaret took the gun? Seems like he would know. All the way in the 80s, he's already like, she's taking guns, she's doing that. I mean, if you were to ask me what I believe, I think Margaret and Yehuda did it. And I think there are people out there who were involved that we don't know who they are. In any case, Margaret served her 20 years. Whether she's guilty or innocent, she did the time. Do you think she is the Black Widow of Las Vegas or do you think she's a, a poor, feeble old lady? Thank you guys so much for watching. I usually come in close because I turn off the camera, but I want to spare you my eye. So thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. 